Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Today we're gonna to be speaking about a yet another topic of breaking into InfoSec. And this time we have very special guest with us, Clint Gabler. He's gonna talk about DevSecOps. Like he can share all the things that he's doing. Over to you, Clint. Cool. Oh. Hey, Vandana, thank you so much for having me. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I guess my uh, background, I went to uh, college and then grad school in computer science. Uh, I then uh, quickly on uh, found that I had a love for security. I sort of audited this class that was focused on security. It was like the only one my college offered. And I was like, oh man, this is awesome. So uh, sort of immediately uh, from there, I started trying to read all the uh, books and do internships in security. Um, I don't think it took me a while to learn enough to know how to like keep learning sort of on my journey, but definitely uh, sort of fell in love with it early on. And then um, after grad school, went into sort of a small sort of security product startup. And then I did uh, security consulting for a number of years. So doing penetration tests uh, and sort of advising other companies. Uh, and then now I work at a sort of a small security startup uh, building in open source uh, static analysis tool called SEMGREP, uh, which is pretty fun. And yeah, I have a security newsletter as well called uh, TLDRSEC, where I spend uh, overly too much time reading uh, uh, security blog posts and watching talks and looking at tools and trying to distill it down into one place to uh, save some people some time. Um, but yeah, happy to chat about anything in more detail, but that's a quick summary. Yeah, actually, Clint, uh, that newsletter gives us so much information. Like, we don't have to go to multiple places. This one thing gives us holistic view and talks about so many things, the talks you like and whatnot. But yes, we're going to talk in detail about it. Like, uh, we want to know more and more and how this idea culminated. Now, while yeah, okay. we're going... Uh, while we are heading towards that, the first thing, I'm sure if, if it's a student who might have a question like, what is DevSecOps? So uh, can you please share your thoughts? What do you feel DevSecOps is? Because it means different to different people, but it has underlying similar algorithm, similar formula or similar thinking behind it. So if you can share your inputs around it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, you said something I was going to say, which is, uh... I don't know if it has a specific concrete definition. I think you ask 10 people, you'll probably have at least nine, maybe 11 uh, opinions. Um, I guess one way to describe it is to look at it from um, a bit of historical context. So like, why did it come about in the first place? Um, so to try to distill, I don't know, like 10 or 15 years and many books down into like a few sentences, um, like if, if you flash back, say, I don't know, 15, 20 years, um, software development happened very differently, right? So in there was this idea of like waterfall where it's like, okay, we, we're gonna diligently plan what we're gonna build and then we're gonna build it and then we're gonna test it and then we're gonna release it uh, and then we'll do it again. And that whole process might take six months or a year. Um, and at that time, security fit in by saying like, okay, you know, after all the code was written, we'll do all the testing, we'll give the feedback uh, to developers, then they'll fix it and then, you know, it'll release. And I think security at the time was very, uh, point in time, it was okay for feedback to be slow. And it was just uh, like things worked well for how software was written then. Um, but gradually how software was written started to change because people were like, well, you know, what are we really trying to do here? We're trying to give users value by giving them new features. And how can we do that better and have a business advantage? We can release software faster. So like, how do we uh, take code that we're writing and test it and give it to users and then iterate based on their feedback sort of faster and faster and faster. So rather than releasing new software to users every six months or a year, you're doing it, you know, weekly or daily. Um, so ultimately like how software started changing is kind of a result of like really just business value, right? It's like, you know, why are companies in business? It's like, well, because users like using their things. And so the faster you can add more things that people like and adjust their feedback, you're going to beat your competitors. So gradually, uh, software started going from sort of waterfall to more agile and like DevOps, like from on-prem to cloud. There's like all these sort of trends that are happening at the same time. And um, so in one world, we have like, you know, how development works is changing. And then meanwhile, for a number of years, I think security teams as a whole were not they sort of, from the outside, they observed this and they were like, oh, I guess this is a thing. But then all of a sudden, years later, they were like, well, our traditional tooling and approaches 
like doesn't work as much anymore because they're like, okay, cool. We thought we used to have weeks to do security testing and then provide feedback and then developers would address it. But now developers are like, cool, like that thing you're telling me about, I did that like months ago and I'm building like the seventh thing after that now. So uh, they, they like, um, it's just, I think the traditional approach of sort of point in time, uh, feedback long after the context has sort of gone. Um, I don't know, you probably find this as well. Like you write a piece of software and then you build a bunch of other things. And then if someone were like, hey, Vandana, like fix that thing you wrote two weeks ago, you're like, I barely even remember how that code works. Or at least you're not like the, the mental context for how all the related code is probably like, uh, you still have it, but maybe it's not as much as when you were writing it. And uh, I think we're seeing like a similar trend um, uh, in sort of DevSecOps. So it, I guess, DevOps and sort of Agile is like the revolution on the engineering side. And then DevSecOps is sort of the revolution on the security side to basically become equal partners with engineering who've already made this other transformation. Uh, and frankly, I think for companies where engineering has embraced this new, faster, iterative model of development, security needs to adapt as well, or else we're going to be uh, left behind and left out of the conversation. So um, like just some, I guess, themes and ideas in DevSecOps that I think are generally important is rather than viewing sort of the engineering team and the security team as like these separate like overlords or like Gandalf who can, you know, slam your staff and say, you shall not pass, um, uh, you cannot release the prod. Like generally most, I think, forward thinking companies, forward thinking companies are not doing that anymore. It's more like, okay, well, how can we have like a customer centric mind? So for security teams, I think engineering and DevOps are our customers. So how can we provide them with security services and libraries and tooling that um, basically allows them to do their job better and faster, right? So it's not like, how do we keep everything safe, but how do we help developers build secure software so it's more like of a partnership rather than sort of separate things and we sort of see different skills being emphasized on security teams at least appsec teams like not just how do we find all the bugs but can you write software that is secure that then developers can use um how can we build like secure by default guardrails and frameworks and netflix often talks about this as sort of like a paved road um Another concept is sort of like shift left, which is rather than running all your security tools after software is written and about to be released, uh, that's like to the right. So shifting left is like, how do we give developers quick, fast feedback uh, as early as possible? So maybe in their IDE or as a pre-commit hook or on every pull request, um, because the sooner you give developers feedback, the more likely they are to fix it. As with anyone, you know, this isn't like a developer specific thing. Anyone who you give, like, you know, if your kid is doing something wrong, and you like immediately are like, hey, why don't you do this like a little bit differently? They're like, oh, okay. Versus like a month later, you're like, remember that thing you did? And they're like, no. Uh, so I think uh, I think people are like, you know, just people uh, regardless of the context. But um, yeah, so I'd say a couple of core principles, like how do we uh, partner with developers to make the things, the software they're building uh, secure and reliable and just make their job easier, make security sort of orthogonal to what they're doing. It's like, it just happens around them rather than something they have to be aware of at every line of code. Cause like, that's hard. Um, you know, how do we like enable partner with them, build things for them, not be gatekeepers and ideally give them quick, fast, accurate feedback as soon as possible. Um, so DevOps or revolution changed software. DevSecOps is like security catching up. So there's more to it, but at least for me, that's kind of like a, a quick summary. Yeah, absolutely. You covered a lot of aspects around DevSecOps because uh, it is picking up in every organization. And no two organizations can have the same DevSecOps processes, but underlying uh, formula is the same, like you explained, people picking up security. And now, uh, this is something which is very, very important for a person who's actually shifting from a different domain to security. Like I have seen a lot of shift from um, testing background, like a QA testing to security, developers becoming uh, security people. So um, have you seen a lot of it or what's your take on it and how soon people can like change all of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, I know a number of people from like a QA or developer background who've joined security uh, or security people who've gone and just become more engineers. Um, and yeah, I think that cross pollination is great because ultimately I think DevSecOps is very uh, multidisciplinary. So I think um, 
I think gone are the days where you can be a security professional who doesn't understand reading and writing software. You really need to understand not just being able to look at some code and understand what it does. Um, you also need to understand like how does the development processes in your company work like? Like like um, you know when does sprint planning happen? What is the iteration speed? Like who owns the outcomes and like how are stories pointed? Like basically you need to be uh, maybe this is sort of getting ahead to some things we're going to talk about later. But I think ultimately like security teams need to be um, sort of influencers within the organization where it's like you don't necessarily have control over how engineers do their work or what they work on, but you need to ideally guide them and convince them and like make the case for why things should be done a certain way uh, in a way that's more sort of secure, but also doesn't necessarily cause a lot of friction. And if you have uh, a QA or developer background, you already understand how these things work. So you're probably going to be very effective in uh, your role as a security person to try to sort of change organizational uh, processes or behavior. Yeah, I, I think uh, now when we are talking about changing the priorities, there is one um, point comes is now people have started to understand that yes, this is a role which is very, very important and not just security uh, has to understand, uh, uh, security has to push something on developers, but they have to understand what exactly developers are doing because it's a mutual responsibility. It's not developer's responsibility. It's not solely security responsibility, wherein we, we, we try and do the blame game. Now, now we all understood, okay, this is it. But then how exactly people progress in this particular role? Like, do they need to know all or do they need to know like a bit portion of it? So how exactly people can progress in this particular area? Because this is so wide. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um... Yeah, I would totally agree with you that I think uh, this area is super wide, like you could spend, I don't know, five, 10 years and like be only medium good at like half of it or something, right? So I think um, that is also just, uh, I think, humbling to realize to be like, you know, it's okay if I don't know everything because that takes a lot of time and maybe you never will. I think most people, I don't think anyone ever knows all of even like one niche because everything in security is like so deep now. Um, so I think that is comforting to be like, it's okay if I don't know everything. Um, but yeah, I, I was thinking about this when you, uh, we were talking about some like questions beforehand and you were like, you know, how does someone get into DevSecOps? And I don't know if I would actually recommend DevSecOps as being like a first entry level job for people, like maybe, but the, the thing is it just requires a background in a number of different things that I feel like, like a new grad, it would be hard for you to already know all those things. Um, like for example, I guess specifically, I think having a bit of a development background in terms of reading and writing code and how software is written in organizations. And then also you probably want um, some like just AppSec, like OWASP top 10 software security background as well. So um, uh, you, if, if you want to like tackle both of those immediately, I think you can, or perhaps an alternate approach could be like, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, be a developer for a year or two and just like, you know, do that by day and like study a lot of security as well and try to maybe take on security related projects or maybe you want to be uh, an AppSec engineer or like a penetration tester or a security consultant, but then also be writing a lot of code and uh, reading about a bunch of like development stuff and maybe partnering with developers and sort of like maybe focusing on one, ramping up and then like cross training in the other. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would say sort of core skills in my mind for DevSecOps is you know, reading and writing code, uh, understanding development processes, but also just strong knowledge of security, um, uh, I guess secure coding as well as common vulnerability classes, um, and I guess interpersonal skills as well, sort of like all of those uh, together. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I guess uh, maybe some people go straight into it, but uh, from what I've seen, oftentimes uh, people have more of a development or security background, and then they sort of cross learn a bit, and then they sort of have a more hybrid role um, after a little bit. Not to say you have to do that, but it's at least uh, what I've seen. And also it's such a new area, I think that it, it didn't really exist maybe five years ago. So I think we're still sort of figuring it out as an industry. Yeah, a lot to learn in this particular area. Like it's so wide, so much, uh, so many things are there. And especially now, no, so many new languages are coming up, platforms are coming up. So too much information, which is overflowing. It's just that we have to grab what we need and mm -hmm. then start using it. Now, it, uh, I'm going to ask a different question around, like if I am into this field now, 
I want to switch jobs or maybe I want to get into it, but then I have to prepare my resume. So if you are hiring, Clint, what are the few things that you will look for in my CV or my resume? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I would say um, I would probably look for, uh, not to repeat myself too much, but yeah, I'd be like, okay, has this person programmed before? Does it seem to me like they can, uh, and also to be clear, I think for DevSecOps uh, people, I don't think you need to be like professional grade top tier developer. It's more like, can you like tie scripts together that automate something? Like if you have uh, a couple of tools you want to integrate into CI, can you like write a script that like, uh, I don't know, make some HTTP request, takes the JSON response, slices and dices it, and, like does something else. It's not like, you know, you need to be able to write things that are super performant, handling like millions of requests a second, like maybe a developer might like. Just writing some code is good. Um, and then, yeah, are you, um, you know, competent with uh, OWASP top 10? And I guess, can you think like a security professional? Can you sort of reason about, like if I describe uh, a website or a system to you, can you point out like potential attacks and like, what would you secure first? Um, I think maybe having, uh, I don't know if I would say like experience with some tools or uh, certifications, like I, I feel like DevSecOps is so uh, new that I don't know if there's really any established certs yet. There are a few, but I don't know if there's any that are like, so like, I guess in more established, uh, to give a counter example, say like for red team or network penetration testing, I feel like OSCP is sort of like an industry standard. Um, that people are like, oh, like, if you have this, I assume you know a certain amount of things. I don't know if we really have that in DevSecOps yet, to be honest. Um, there are a few that uh, I think are good. I don't have sort of firsthand experience with them, so I'm not going to sort of comment on whether I think they're good or not. Um, but I, um, I I, don't know of any certs, at least in this space yet, that if I saw someone who had it, I would be like, I know you know things. Um, like, I'd be like, oh, I see that you have taken the effort to uplevel yourself, which I think is awesome, but it isn't necessarily, uh, I think, like wide practice yet um, for certs in particular. Um, but yeah, I would say, like, have you been embedded in an engineering organization? Have you um, been at like maybe a more like a modern tech company, maybe not necessarily one that uh, is, you know, 20 or 30 years old and how they write software is probably different than sort of a modern, like agile DevOpsy type things. Um, yeah, I guess like, have you um, uh, integrated tools into the CI CD process? Can you talk about how software is written and deployed in practice? Um, maybe some familiarity with cloud things, um, but I would maybe consider that actually a fork in the road. Like, do you want to focus more on AppSec or like cloud security and Kubernetes and sort of containers? Um, I think doing both of those, especially at first, is too much. Like you can do both eventually, but I would like for me, for example, I'm focusing more on AppSec than cloud and containers. Like I read about cloud and containers, but it's like uh, I sort of made the conscious choice not to try to become an expert in those, at least right now, because it's like too much. It's just uh, overwhelming. Um, actually, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Alex Smolin, had a uh, Twitter thread recently about like. So he's uh, the director of security at LaunchDarkly, which is a, a startup that's doing quite well. And he did um, have like a, a brief thread on like what he would look in the uh, resumes when he's hiring. Uh, cool. Yeah. Well, I'll uh, throw, uh, uh, I guess I'll, I'll quickly um, read uh, some of what he said. So he said, uh, throwing a bunch of tools in CI and generating a bunch of security findings isn't valuable by itself, which I think is sort of the traditional security mindset. Uh, if I see this, I'll dig in with some questions to see if shifting left solved real problems, such as uh, what types of vulnerabilities were you trying to identify? How did you deal with false positives? That is uh, results from tools that aren't uh, sort of true vulnerabilities. Uh, how did you help the development team learn how to use the new tools? How did you measure and manage how these tools affected development metrics like commit to deploy time? So like, are you slowing down development? Uh, what was the vulnerability management process to ensure issues got fixed, right? So you could find all the things, but if you don't actually fix them, it's not that great. Uh, and then how did you address the backlog of issues from uh, existing code? Um, so he says, in summary, buying and using security products is easy. Identifying and solving security problems is hard. Show you can do the latter. Um, so that's what he does as a security hiring manager. And uh, yeah, I thought that was really insightful. So I saved a reference to it. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's very, very insightful because these are the questions which generally tend to miss out on. Like, what are the things they should cover as part of uh, their resume as well as the interview questions, right? Because um, when we go ahead for interview, we'll be like, okay, we are confident. And sometimes we are underconfident. We have done work. So these questions are actually a good starter wherein you feel, okay, at least I know these things. And if I don't know something, I'll probably learn about and tell that, okay, these are the things that I will learn. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, while you have shared this wonderful uh, note, which I'm going to be putting in the comment section, anything, um, maybe any blogs, uh, any books, podcast, or like uh, a newsletter, anything that you want to share or discuss about that people should know when they're getting into this field or even for the people who are already part of this field, because we have a lot to learn from all of us. So probably, yes, if you can share that. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, 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 a lot of ideas in this because uh, I am sort of a connoisseur of like uh, cool work in this space. Um, so some uh, like company blogs that I feel are very good uh, in this space are um, Netflix, for example, like any uh, blogs or um, talks from the security team, I think are consistently very good. Uh, Segment and Figma, I think, have some pretty good um, security engineering type uh, blog content as well. Uh, in terms of talks, I think um, anything by Zane Lackey is really good. Um, I had a couple of talks uh, that I think are reasonably good in terms of uh, one was uh, how to 10x your security, where I tried to take the best everyone is talking about and like condense it down into one talk. I think it was like 200 slides. Uh, I only covered like 100 in like the 50 minutes, but I was like, go, 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 go. So I think that's like a nice... Uh, culmination of a lot of other people's work. It's mostly just me trying to share other people doing awesome things. Um, and then I had a talk on like trying to eliminate vulnerability classes. Uh, I moderated a number of DevSecOps panels with some really smart people from uh, Netflix and Slack and Apple and Datadog and Dropbox and others. Um, so I think on my website, I, I have links to a bunch of those uh, that I can share with you. But um, uh, yeah, we asked them a bunch of questions about like, you know, what sort of metrics do you have for your security program? How do you start a security program? And like lots of good stuff like that. Um, let's see, uh, there's a book from Google called uh, Building Secure and Reliable Systems, uh, which is uh, free, actually, if you go to their site. Um, Gene Kim is a, a sort of a big DevOps person, and he has a couple of books that are good. Um, and then I guess uh, one person who's consistently great uh, Tanya Yanka. Uh, I think checking out her stuff is great. Uh, checking out anything from you, I think is uh, certainly uh, more than worth people's time. Um, and then a couple other people like Alex Smolin, uh, mentioned him earlier, Scott Piper for anything AWS, uh, Mark Manning or Marco Lancini for anything cloud or containers. Um, and then lastly, uh, <laughs> newsletters. Uh, I think Unsupervised Learning by Daniel Meisler is great. Um, cloud Sec List by Marco Lancini. Also great. Um, and then humbly, I would put forth uh, TLDR sec, uh, my newsletter as well as uh, hopefully not a waste of your time. Absolutely, it does not. But we do want to know more about TLR sec, TLDR sec, because um, you've been very diligent in sharing it with all of us. Like I've seen people, they start the newsletter and then just it just vanish away. So we do want to know about it because this is one place where people actually can get so much information about DevSecOps. So if you can share what are the things that you cover or how frequently that you share, how people can actually subscribe to it. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's uh, a newsletter I send out uh, about weekly. I would say uh, like about 49 weeks a year. I think I take off maybe Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's or something. But other than that, it's every week. Um, you can sign up if you go to uh, tldrsec.com. Um, so you can just put in your email there and I'll send you a friendly welcome email. And then uh, every week, uh, you'll hopefully see it in your inbox. Um, if you don't check your spam, uh, sometimes uh, Gmail or others are, are unkind. Um, and in terms of what it covers, um, I try to cover a bit of everything. So um, I guess some of the common sections I have are just like AppSec or web security or uh, container security or cloud security, um, some like uh, more sometimes like DevSecOps focused things or uh, fuzzing or like career things or Really, I think 
sometimes like reverse engineering and like detection response. I would say almost uh, some, sometimes cryptography, but like that's not a big focus of mine. I would say I try to have a representative coverage of like everything in security in case like whatever your interests are, it'll have something in there at least every once in a while. Um, but I would say the sort of core most common topics I cover are probably um, like AppSec, web security, cloud containers, uh, DevSecOps, scaling security. Those are probably the bread and butter. And then it does a little bit of everything else, but those I would say are the main focuses. Very interesting. Uh, Clint, before we part ways, I do want to um, give you the stage to share anything that I've missed asking about this particular domain, this particular area, or the space, which you are one of the champions. So would you, if, if you would like to share that. Uh, sure. I think um, one trend that I think is really important for people to think about, um, it's still early stages. So I think this is like a new and blossoming idea. Uh, it's not new to some, but I think across the industry, it's still early stages. Um, and this idea of security moving from how do we find all the vulnerabilities to how can we embrace uh, secure defaults and other approaches that basically eliminate classes of vulnerabilities rather than uh, trying to play sort of bug whack-a-mole and you're like, okay, we fix this, we fix this. And like, how can we just provide developers with secure by default libraries that eliminate classes of vulnerabilities by construction? Um, and this, I think, is still an idea not a lot of, especially sort of security old guard people agree with or believe in. Um, I think it's still like, like if you think back, you know, everybody now is like cool, like agile and DevOps, this is the future. But if you go back 10 or 15 years, it was like this crazy thing that only a few companies were doing. You know, there were these like, like Slack and Netflix and others were like, yeah, we're pushing to prod, uh, you know, 20 times a day. And everybody else was like, that's insane. Your company's going to explode. Like, there's no way this can work. But now it's like, everyone does that. And it's like, of course you do that. Uh, and I think sort of secure guardrails or secure defaults, I think that's where that idea is now. So now it's like, yeah, there's some sort of forward thinking companies that are doing it. Um, like the uh, Google talks about it in their book. Facebook has a blog post about it. Microsoft has written about it. Netflix has given many talks about it. Uh, Dropbox, DocuSign, Slack, like a bunch of companies are talking about it, but I think it's hasn't yet hit broad market awareness. But I think over the next um, couple of years, hopefully less than five, I think we're going to see a broader awareness amongst security professionals that are like, my job is not to try to find all the things that are wrong. It's to instead build sort of secure building blocks and primitives and libraries that my engineering colleagues can use, which if they use those, uh, I can guarantee that many vulnerability classes can't happen by construction. Just like, for example, like parsing XML is kind of a minefield, right? Like if you don't do things securely, you're vulnerable to uh, XXE. Uh, but if you just give someone a library that's like, if you just parse with this, XXE can't happen, then they don't even need to know that XXE is a thing, right? They can just do their job and not worry about it. Similar with um, like parameterized queries with SQL and SQL injection and stuff like that. So um, I think that's a huge thing uh, that people should read about. And, um, uh, and I think one, sort of uh, angle with that is like, that flips the script in terms of what tooling makes sense. So if you're trying to find vulnerabilities, you would use one approach, but if you're like, well, we know that the thing, we know what people should be doing. Um, so we just have to check to make sure they're doing the thing we expect them to be doing. Um, and that's uh, sort of the niche uh, or one of the niches um, this open source tool uh, my company is building SEMGRIP is like, cool, well, let's build something really flexible, really lightweight, really fast and sort of easy for anyone to use and customize. And then um, make it so that it's very easy for developers as well as security teams to say, hey, these are the good pattern patterns for my organization. Tell me when they're not being used. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'm optimistic in the next two to five years, uh, certain classes of vulnerabilities uh, at least at some companies will be uh, largely wiped out. And then maybe the next version of the OWASP Top 10 will actually be different because you know we're not having the same issues we've had for you know 20 years. So every time the OWASP Top 10 is mostly the same, I feel like we failed. So I want it to be different uh, next time. But I would say that this time it has shuffled a lot. It has it shuffled a lot this a lot time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Clint, for sharing all the wonderful insights. I am sure people are going to reach out to you. And uh, there are so many wonderful things on your Twitter handle, which you are sharing every day. It's amazing. Oh, like all the open source tools. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to you for sharing all of that. Oh, thanks to uh, all the people actually doing the work. I'm just trying to help share uh, the great work people are doing. It was wonderful chatting with you and look forward to meeting you again. Yeah, same. Looking forward to it. Thank you.